If he holders, let him go. The reflection on the book by Chester Hines. The title of the book is taken from a counting rhyme that children still use. The rhyme is racist in its origin. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger by the toe. If he hollers, let him go. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. When I was a kid um, growing up in the late 60s and 70s, we didn't say tiger. I think everybody knows what was said. Um, the words have changed to this rhyme, but it doesn't change the racist origin of it. This is a story about anger. Um, this is my interpretation. Um, the anger is created by constantly dealing with racism. When people are marginalized, they don't think clearly because the anger clouds their judgment. I think people in positions of power use the anger to their advantage to get people to do things that um, wouldn't normally do. Um, I like this quote by Himes um, when the main character Bob gets to work and he's having to deal with all the white people on the way into work. He says the white folks that sure brought their white to work with them that morning. Um, the story takes place during World War II in Los Angeles. The story is centered around the shipyards that are building warships. The three main characters are Bob. He's a black man who works at Atlas Shipyards. He's a leader man for a crew of black workers. Alice is Bob's girlfriend. She's a social worker and the father is a doctor. Um, I think it needs to be pointed out that Alice's family is... Um, one of the more affluent black families in the area because her father's a doctor and she's a social worker. And then Madge is a white woman from Texas, from Texas who works as a welder at Atlas. Um, he's the, I guess you call it the antagonist in the story. Little background on June 25th, 1941, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 8802, which was the prohibition of discrimination in the defense industry. There shall be no discrimination in the employment of workers in the defense industries or government because of race, creed, color, or national origin. Roosevelt signed the order in response to a meeting with Philip A. Randolph. He was the president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Randolph warned Roosevelt that mass demonstrations in response to unfair labor practices um, in the defense industries. Basically, the defense industries were really rolling in, even though the United States wasn't in the war when this was signed, but the defense industries were really ramping up and this um, comes from the Takaki book, this information um, from the Ronald Takaki book, um, A Different Mirror. And basically from the reading on it, war production was creating huge profits and they did all through the whole war. And the people that owned these companies didn't want them slowed down at all. So Roosevelt signed this to just kind of back off the demonstrations. It was never enforced though, and that's the problem. Um, trouble starts when Bob gets, tries, he's at work and he's, his crew needs a welder to do some work. Um, there's no black welders are available and all the white men who are welders claim they're busy. You know I mean, he's looking around trying to get somebody to just do like a half hour's work. We asked um, this, white woman named, well, this white woman named Madge to do some welding, and of course she refuses to work for a black crew. And she makes a racist comment, and then Bob makes a racist comment back, and, and he gets called in and is demoted over the incident. Later he gets in a fight over a crap game and gets knocked out by a man named Johnny Stauber. Bob wants to kill him. I mean, he is really livid. I mean, like I said, the anger has been building all day. 
And he sets out to kill him, runs with a knife, and he stops himself. And then he actually goes to his house with a gun, but he sees his family and decides not to. A little background on this, too, is the real pressure for integration in the defense industries came from the sheer need for labor in America's arsenal of democracy, as it was called. At the beginning of 1942, only 3% of the defense workers were black. By, 19, by November of 1944, it jumped to 8.3%. Of the 1 million blacks employed in the defense industry, 600,000 of them were women. By 1944, black women constituted 18% of the female workforce. And of course, as African-Americans, followed the defense jobs into the cities, they often found themselves targeted by hate crimes and violence. Um, I think it also should be noted that a lot of the black women left their jobs as maids and servants and janitors, the same with men. And there was a shortage of um, people to fill these servile positions. There was money to be made in these defense industries, even though they were still treated with discriminatory practices, they could make a, a huge amount of money. I mean, at the time it was like 60 cents an hour, but that was a good wage and nothing compared you know, to their old roles as maids and janitors. So there was a lot of hate towards the blacks because of this. After all this, you know, Bob, he's a leader, man. He's got a good salary. So he decides to spend some of his money. He's got a nice car and he wants to take Alice to dinner in a fancy hotel and he makes reservations. But when he gets there, they're forced to sit in the kitchen because black. And it compound that after dinner, they're pulled over in a white neighborhood and they're just brought into the station because they're black in the white neighborhood. Bob has to post bail and they leave and they meet some friends of Alice and Bob doesn't like them. They're educated. Some of them are white. Bob doesn't feel they understand the everyday problems that blacks encounter. Alice wants Bob to apologize to Madge and hopes he can get reinstated as a leader man. She kind of wants him to have an air of prestige, I think, to come up to her standard because she's somewhat affluent and he thinks he following the rules will get him there, but he finding out, you know, that even as much as he follows the rules, there's going to be somebody that's going to step in his way. You know, and Bob's, Alice's father tells Bob, you know, these inspiring things about what the black people are doing these days. And Bob, he's just miffed at the whole thing because he goes to that shipyard every day and he sees what's going on. Um, Bob meets with his union rep there as grievances about being demoted. Um, he realizes the union representative is just there to keep them in line. Um, as an, and on a further note, during the war, 12 million workers were organized in the AFL and CIO, the labor organizations. Labor management committees were set up in 5,000 factories as a gesture towards industrial democracy but acted mostly as disciplinary groups for absentee workers and devices for increasing production. And, you know, they worked for the defense industries, basically. They were union reps, but they were kind of under pressure to go with the flow, too. And the flow was the wealthy elite, keep the profits going. Um, despite this, there was... Um, Despite the profits, there was 14,000 strikes during the war because of frozen wages while profits were soaring. You know, Bob, he confronts Madge at lunch about losing his job. He realized that she's so concerned about it, that this is just something normal for her. You know, it, it affected him a lot, but it was just, you know, something she, did, she, she does on a daily basis. So he gets mad at her and he needs to enact some sort of power over her. Um, kind of gets get her back for what she's done to him. And he figures if he can um he wants to use sex to get the feeling of empowerment over her. But 
after he's in her apartment and they're wrestling around, he, he realizes it's Madge that's using the sex to get the power over him. I mean, he can she can threaten him as a rapist. He realizes she's kind of a sick, twisted individual. Bob meets Alice for lunch and asks her to marry him. He decided that, you know, he's just going to marry her. He's going to do what he's told. He's going to go to college at night. And he kind of returns to work with his attitude. Then he runs into Madge in a dark room on the ship. And when he refuses her advances, she screams rape. He's beaten badly by white men and he's arrested. He escapes, but he is eventually arrested again. The judge offers to have the charges dropped if Bob joins the army. And it contemplates what's actually happened to him, and he joins the army. You know, he just realizes it was once once he lost his temper, he was never going to win. And that's what's happened. Because they won't allow him to air his grievances about anything. He has to go with flow and play by the rules and rules are different for black people. All through the book, um, Himes brings up these dreams that Bob's having. Um, he has one of, you know, about uh, at the beginning of the book where they're trying to find a crippled man and they keep running these black guys up the stairs um, and they, they wait to see one that limps going up the stairs. They've obviously decided that it's a black man that's done the crime, and they're just going to run them up the stairs till they find out which one's crippled. Um, and there's two poor peckerwoods were standing over me and beating me with his lengths of rubber hose. This goes back to the beating he took after the crap game, and he's probably taken others. Then he, what at first, I saw it looked like a rag doll, but when I turned it over, I saw it was Alice. He sees Alice in a drugstore and she drifts away with some people he doesn't really like. And so he follows her and pulls out a gun and he can't hide the gun. And then Alice runs away and she's attacked by a bunch of wild pigs and just turned into a rag doll. And, you know, it's, I think he's trying to protect her from these people she's hanging around. And another one where he was just chasing the colored boy and stabbing to death with a quarter inch blade and laughing like it was funny as hell. A black guy and a white guy are in a knife fight and the black guy can't land any of his jabs. And then the white guy is poking him about a hundred thousand times, you know, with these this tiny blade just making these little puncture wounds and I think it goes to all the jabs Bob feels during the day with the racist things that happens to him and the last one I think is the best quote of the book I looked down at him and knew he was dead and felt a crazy exultation as if I'd conquered the world and gotten past gotten through wrapped up in the glory of immortality as free god damn it as Thomas Jefferson um, this is a dream he has where he goes to Johnny Stoddard's house and shoots him. But after the exaltation, he's chased and he's in trouble. So it turns on him again. And here's my bibliography. And that's the end. Thank you.